at 21, I was a junior at Wesleyan University. I decided to spend a semester abroad, but I made a choice that many, including my parents, found peculiar. I chose to go to the slums of Nairobi, Kenya. At 21, I knew that I'll never make it. By this time, most of my friends have died from violence, disease, or sheer hopelessness. It was a tough life. And I knew that my future prospect depends only on a place I was raised, Kibera, the largest slum in Africa. In Kibera, I taught myself how to read from collecting scraps of newspapers from the trash. My only schooling was life hard lessons that I learned on the street as a homeless child. That was your fate if you grew up in a place like Kibera. Obviously, Kennedy and I could not have been more different. From the moment I was born in Denver, Colorado, I had a shot at an education, a future. As a teenager, the issues I struggled with were what college I might go to or what shoes to wear to school. I never had shoes until I was 16 years old. So how is it, you're probably asking yourself, that we found each other and together are building a movement that's transforming urban poverty into urban promise? And the answer is forgiveness. People tend to think of forgiveness as an all or nothing proposition. Either you've forgiven someone or you haven't. This makes it really hard to do and often impossible to start. We think of forgiveness in stages. We are going to tell you three stages of forgiveness. To do this, you need to understand how I got to Kibera in the first place. After deciding to spend my semester abroad in Nairobi, I by chance found out about Kennedy and his community organization, Shining Hope for Communities, or Shofko, that he'd started in Kibera. Shofko provides services that interrupt survival mode, organizes communities, and empowers girls who will become the leaders of the future. From Denver, I wrote an email introducing myself and offering my help. Dear Kennedy, the email started. An email from a white girl in America <laughs> <laughs> who wanted to help us. Another white savior, I thought, as if my continent was not ruined by white colonists, <laughs> by Christian missionaries who wanted to help, by the paternalism that exists in the NGO framework. Outsiders cannot solve our problems in Kibera. We can solve our own problems. That's why I set out to start Shofko. As my mom always say, only he who wears the shoes knows exactly where it pinches. After some time, I finally got a response from him, asking for my resume. I spent a lot of time working on that resume. There was something special about this girl. So I told her, but you can't come to help us. You can only come to partner with us. I was painfully aware of the legacy of colonialism aware of the permanence of privilege imprinted on my own body, aware that these privileges were so randomly given to me while others were just as randomly denied. I did nothing to be born in Denver. Kennedy did nothing to be born in Kibera, and yet this is what happened. I would have been paralyzed by guilt about my privilege, except that Kennedy said to me with great compassion, Jessica, you can represent all the white people. <laughs> Guilt is a luxury. Guilt is a luxury.
we think the first stage of forgiveness is tolerance. Today, tolerance has fallen out of fashion. It's considered neutral at best and patronizing at worst. Tolerance is a simple acknowledgement of another person's existence. Tolerance gives you a little space to breathe. From there, you can recover from the source of your grief and regain your strength. Therefore, the first step of forgiveness is tolerance. I decided that the only way I could understand the community and authentically serve Shafko was if I lived in Kibera too. So I told Kennedy I was moving in. You are crazy. <laughs> you can live in a 10 by 10 room where there is no running water, there is no toilet. And there's never been a white person living inside the slum. Don't be ridiculous, I told him. You're not the boss of me, I reminded him. If you can live there, why can't I? What will your parents say? I ask her. I don't plan on telling them. <laughs> I've always found it easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. This brings me to the next second stage of forgiveness, which is forgetting. <laughs> Unlike tolerance, forgetting is active. When you intentionally forget, you create the space for something new. Most of us spend a lot of time in default mode, acting on beliefs and worldviews shaped by our past experience. Too often, we get stuck because these beliefs and worldviews become invisible to us, unconscious. When I moved into the slums of Kibera, I forgot my parents' worries, my country's warnings. Growing up in a place like Kibera, there is a need for intentional forgetting, or else you'll be stuck forever. In my early life experience, I learned that if you are born poor, your life has no value. And in my childhood life, I also learned that when you draw the short straw in life, nobody cares if you live or if you die. I have to forgive those who watched while my friends died. I also have to forgive those who drew the long straw. Otherwise, I'll be stuck forever. Forgetting allows you to move forward. It can give you a new lease on life so that you build a new world view. Jessica moved in Kibera, in our simple house. And for one week, my curious neighbors were knocking the door to find out if that white girl survived the night. <laughs> I survived, and, and then, then we, we fell, fell in, in love. love. <laughs> Despite the challenges and difference that exist between us, such as white and black, poor and rich, male and female. Not like it was all roses. We had plenty of fights. We still do. There is, and despite all those challenges I spoke about, I asked her to marry me, and she says, yes. Except that before he asked me to marry him, he tricked me into getting married. When I said it's better to ask forgiveness than permission, I didn't mean this. Let me explain. <laughs> there is a culture in my tradition that before you leave the country, you must build a house. And because I got a scholarship to study in America, I had to build a house. And building a house is also a process of the wedding rituals. Except all he tells me is we have to build some hut in some village before he can leave the country. So what can I do but agree? And then there I am, standing there, encircled by his entire family in the empty space where the house will be built. And there's a matriarch 
reciting what are clearly prayers. And though I don't speak Luo, I get the gist. And then suddenly she takes my hand and places it in Kennedy's. And that's when it hits me. Kennedy, is this a wedding? <laughs> a wedding looks the same in any language. <laughs> I knew you would understand. You didn't give me a You didn't give me a chance to understand and then it was too late. I have to admit probably that I could have told you. <laughs> But I knew I wanted to build my house life with Jessica. And after a while, I forgave him. <laughs> Because I knew I wanted to build a life with Kennedy too. This brings me to the final and the third stage of forgiveness, which is release. When you release, you set yourself free. Grudges, bitterness, resentment, they're all burdens. They narrow our options, our relationships, our experiences of life. Forgiveness releases us. Forgiveness doesn't delete the past. Forgiveness enriches the future. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you give up your boundaries or your identity. It's not surrender, but it is new space, new potential. And forgiveness has to come from the position of power. And forgiveness can't be rushed. There are times and situations where it is so difficult, it seems almost impossible. For example, I remember when I was a little boy, my father did terrible things. He stole the little money my mom has earned for food, and he spent it on alcohol. He was drunk and violent. I was only six years old, and I wanted him to love me. You still do. But I never understood why he never treated me like his son. When I first met Kennedy's father, he asked me, what do you want with my son? Son? He calls me son? Then he asked me, do you even love my son? She told him she loved me. When he left, I asked Kennedy how he could possibly forgive his father. Forgiveness is not about him. I told her, forgiveness is about me. Life is about what you hold on to and what you release. That's what makes or destroys you. And I'm not fully forgiven him 100% because forgiveness is a process. The important thing with forgiveness is to start. You have the rest of your life to finish. You have to realize that nothing is as straightforward, as untinged with fear as perhaps I'd once thought. Not love, not parenthood. No act as daring as claiming another as your own. Despite all the human progress that has been made in the world today, but there's still so much violence, so much and oppression, so much fear, so much us versus them. We think forgiveness is a big idea. But not forgiveness granted in a rush. Not forgiveness granted out of fear. But forgiveness granted slowly, steady, with a heart of compassion. When we forgive, it creates new space. That space might hold the possibility for a child, for a new philosophy, for a business idea. But in our case, it created the space for an organization that is transforming realities for the urban poor, changing tens of thousands of lives. 
But if that space is blocked by anger and art, nothing will grow. The final stage of forgiveness, the release, is often marked by some sort of ritual. In our case, we have to do a big ritual. And this so that we can overcome the legacy of colonization, black and white, poor and rich. And our ritual has been our work together. We understood that we were stronger together, that together we could do so much more. We could be a bridge between our two continents, our two worlds, that we could do so much more than we thought possible. Today, in our communities, more and more women report becoming financially empowered, participating in household decisions. Men are becoming champions of girls' rights. Community members from different tribes are coming together to promote peace. And our girls never cease to amaze us. They continue to be at the very top of their entire district. But fighting for this change and loving each other along the way hasn't always been easy. I learned that I can't walk in Kennedy's shoes. I learned I can't walk in Jessica's shoes. But we can walk together. <laughs> Thank you.